everybody. Welcome to lecture 4.2, Urban Revolution in Southeast Asia. So I want to start today's class by defining the features of a city. According to archaeologist Gordon V. Child, a city is comprised of a large and relatively dense settlement with a population in the thousands. You also have specialization and interdependence between the city and its rural hinterlands, as well as interdependence between specialist craftspeople and other groups. In addition to these features, there's a degree of organizational complexity within cities in which you have centralized institutions that regulate internal and external affairs. One of the, the main kind of urban centers that I want to talk about today is the Indus Valley. So the Indus Valley refers to the area in northeastern India and Pakistan. The first archaeological remains of the Indus Valley civilizations was identified by James Lewis in 1862, who excavated a small town called Harappa. Since Lewis's excavations in the 19th century, approximately a thousand different sites have been identified linked to this Indus River Valley civilization complex. What we see in the Indus Valley is that Around 7,000 BC, there are small agricultural villages that emerge. By 3,000 BC, these small agricultural villages have become large-scale settlements with evidence of trade in metals and semi-precious stones for agricultural products. So the question is, what catalyzed the development of urban centers in the Indus Valley? Well, the answer is, trade. After about 2600 BC, Sumerian groups living in the Middle East and Mesopotamia reorganized their trade in luxury and raw materials and obtained them through sea trade instead of using overland routes with the Iranian plateau. One of these new trading partners was the settlement of Maluha, located in the Indus Valley. Archaeologists hypothesize that the dramatic increase in long-distance trade with Mesopotamia may have catalyzed this shift from small-scale agricultural settlements to major urban centers within the Indus Valley. This new trade system brought South Asia into an early world system linking Eastern Mediterranean cities with Eurasia and Western and Southern Asia. There's five major Harapin or Indus Valley civilizations that we want to think about. Uh, Harappa, Mohindaro, uh, Ganwarela, Rakhidara, and Dalavari. Both Harappa and Mohindaro were built on artificial mounds above the floodplains, a task that would have required a substantial amount of manpower and effort. These cities formed the kind of center of regional activity that were linked by common types of symbolism and religious beliefs, but had very different administrative and social systems. So let's zoom in onto one of these major Harappan cities, Mohandarho. So Mohandarho was occupied from roughly 2500 to 1500 BC and has clear cultural links with Western and Central Asia. They were one of these kind of early agricultural settlements that was based on the production of Asian wheat, rice, and barley, and used those products to exchange for copper, as well as turquoise and shells. The city of Mohandaro was by far the largest of all the Harappan urban centers. It covered roughly 618 acres and was rebuilt at least nine different times. Our best guess of what the population was is that Mohandaro at its height would have had about 40,000 people. If you include the suburbs of the city, the population was closer to 100,000. Mohandaro itself is divided into a western citadel complex and an eastern residential area. 
Let's look at the citadel complex. So this is a kind of formalized temp temple area that would have been motivated by some kind of centralized religious institution. So you see behind me a raised area with a citadel in the west that included public religious buildings. You can see here. The city itself was well planned and had cardly, cardinally oriented streets as well as uniformly sized bricks, showing that there was a high degree of standardization. We also see an emphasis on water provisioning, drainage, and a series of protective walls that covered the entire uh, citadel complex, as well as the suburbs. At Moandara, we see many advances in architecture dating to this period. For example, there's dockyards, granaries, brick, brick platforms, and an elaborate sewer system. So what they, what they did at Mohandara was to use clay pipes to carry dirty water from buildings at the citadel and homes in the suburb into a main central sewer system that emptied into the Indus River. This is one of the first pieces of archeological evidence that we have that people actually had bathrooms in their homes. Something that we definitely take for granted today, huh? So Moandaro itself consists of a towering citadel rising 40 feet into the air and is protected by a massive set of flood embankments. Public buildings on the summit of this uh, citadel complex include a pillared hall almost 90 square feet, which may have been a precinct where rulers gave audience to petitioners and visiting officials. At Mohandaro, there is a striking absence of large-scale temples, shrines, or palaces, with the exception of the citadel itself, which included a granary and defensive walls, as I've mentioned. Instead of a kind of massive, uh, complex religious structure, what we see is that religious life centered on a massive bath complex that was fed by an underground well. So surrounding this bath complex is an imposing colonnade and a series of steps that you could use to approach the bath from each end. Ceremonial bathing, called lustration, was an important part of later religious ceremonies in the Indian subcontinent. So the early archaeological evidence that we have for bathing at Mohandaro su su suggests that the great bath in this city may have been used by devotees to carry out ceremonial bathing rituals. So there's several different types of technological advances that we see associated with Mohandaro and which is indicative of larger kind of social developments across the Indus Valley. So as I've discussed, we see these kind of highly prote protected and productive cities being emerging in the Indus Valley. These cities had a strong bureaucratic nature, suggesting that goods probably moved through official means rather than through commerce, independent forms of commerce. As a result of this kind of centralization of commerce, we see a standardization of weights and measurements used, used to, to measure and price out the exchange of goods. As part of this kind of bureaucratic process, we also see the development of official seals that had carvings used to identify property and to stamp trade goods. These seals were decorated with elaborate animal motifs of things like elephants, water buffalo, tigers, and even unicorns. For example, the seal uh, shown behind me 
in which a man is shown sitting in a yoga position surrounded by animals, including tigers, elephants, and rhinoceroses. This seal image really resembles the Hindu god Shiva, who is known as the friend of animals. Based on later beliefs, this early Shiva-like figure may have served as a fertility god and a tamer destroyer of beasts. We also see at Mohandaro the large-scale production of terracotta ceramics, beads, copper, and bronze. These ceramics were wheel-made and, and were used to transport water from the suburbs into the city center. The potter's workshops throughout Mohandaro are filled with examples of painted pots decorated with similar animal figures to what we saw on the seals. In addition to these sorts of examples of material culture, we also see the development of an Indus script system. So think back to lecture 4.1 when we were talking about those traits of civilization. Writing is a, a central trait that we think of when we think about complex societies, and we find it here in the Indus Valley. The earliest, earliest example of this Indus script was found on pottery from Harappa and dates to between 3500 and 2700 BC. Enough of the Indus script has been deciphered to show that some of the seal inscriptions that I showed you earlier were actually designating names of individuals as well as their rank in society. Some of these other seals seem to describe major figures of the Harappan cosmos. The average length of most inscriptions that we've found to date at Mohandaro are about five signs long, with the longest being 26. There's 400 basic signs in this kind of alphabet, all of which have been associated with these seals. Essentially, the Indus script is what's called logosyllabic, meaning that it expresses both words and sounds. A single unit represents represented by a downward stroke and semicircle would be used, a single unit would be represented by a downward stroke, whereas a semicircle would be used to represent units of 10. This type of symbolic system designated the names of people and their rank, trade transactions, and narrative images related to myths or stories. The population of these major urban centers in the Indus Valley gradually dispersed into smaller settlements over time, accompanied by dramatic declines in long distance trade, with the exception of metal. We also see a, an apparently sudden decline may have linked to several particular factors. So some of the key factors that we see for why Harappan cities like Mohandaro ended up being abandoned over time was one flooding along the Indus River, which caused a, caused a shift in subsistence farming strategies, a change from kind of millet to rice cultivation in response to the changing climate. We also see shifts in patterns of Mesopotamia trade, which was a key source of wealth within these large urban centers. Another fundamental change was a major geological disturbance near the source of the Saraswat River, causing it to dry up. This had a catastrophic effect on agricultural production in the Indus Valley and led to disaggregation into smaller villages linked to this similar shift from millet to rice cultivation. In what's left of today's class, I want to shift gears to another one of these Southeast Asian civilizations and talk about the Khmer Empire. The Khmer Empire was in existence between roughly 802 and 1431 CE. This empire encompasses modern day Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and southern Vietnam. 
Much like we see in the Indus Valley, there's evidence of small agricultural villages in these areas as early as 7000 BC. These villages were later united under the Chimera Empire through the ruler Jayavarma II, and, the, and who created the capital city of the empire, Angkor. What we see as part of the Chimera Empire is now a fairly, uh, fairly um, well understood set of criteria that make these urban centers complex cities. So we see a central bureaucracy with a stratified administrative system used to rule over 23 different provinces. Previous monarchs had encouraged the worship of the god Shiva, but under Jayavarma II, he actually presented himself as the reincarnation of Shiva on earth. So as a kind of divine ruler, Jayavarma became um, a, the kind of focal point of this empire uh, and was the primary supervisor of basically every aspect of Chimera life, from agriculture to warfare, tax collection, as well as rituals relate, related to the state's religion. Under the Chimer Empire, a custom developed of building new majestic and holy temples to house the royal symbols of each king. This led to the construction of massive religious structures to commemorate each king's reign. These, these structures included things like reservoirs, canals, extensive road networks, and temple complexes. The, one of these key places that I'll show you is Angkor Wat, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Angkor Wat is an extraordinary shrine complex, the largest religious building in the entire world. The complex is about 5,000 by 4,000 feet. The central block itself measures 700 feet long and rises over 200 feet above the forest. This palace dwarfs the largest Sumerian ziggurat and makes Mohandaro's citadel look like a village shrine. So Angkor Wat was not just an elaborate temple complex, but was also intimately layered into Khmer beliefs about the afterlife and the cosmos. So it was believed that the gods lived at the summit of Meru, Mount Meru, and that this mountain is represented at Angkor Wat by the highest central tower. The remaining four towers around this uh, representation of Mount Meru were, are considered Meru's lesser peaks. So we see the replication of this cosmological landscape within the temple complex itself. We also see this enclosure wall around the main temple complex that is intended to depict the mountains at the edge of the world. So this wall is representing the extent of the cosmos. Surrounding this entire temple complex is a large moat which depicts the ocean beyond. So in addition to this elaborate kind of temple complex representing the, the Chimer understanding of the cosmos, various different Chimer kings created temples within this complex. One in particular was dedicated to the god Vishnu. During his lifetime, Suravana II used Angkor Wat as a place to communicate with the gods as he took on divine status. When he died, his body was placed in the central tower so that his soul entered his divine image and made contact with his royal ancestors. After death, it was believed that the god king became one with Vishnu. Throughout this extensive palace complex, we see highly elaborate relief statues depicting the king's activities. What you see behind me is a base relief showing King Suravama seated on a wooden throne wearing an elaborate crown and a pectoral, 
of bronzes. He received high officials as they are declaring his loyalty. This base relief refers to a particular sculptural style in which the projection in which you have images that project out from the surrounding surface, but not uh, not in a really defined way. Here's another example of these base reliefs uh, depicting the army of King Suryavarma II. But of course, all was not perfect in Angkor, just like all was not perfect in Mohandaro at the Indus River Valley. The construction of Angkor Wat taxed the resources of the kingdom severely during a time of increased competition with neighboring powers. The impression of prosperity and stability provided by the reliefs at Angkor Wat was an important way in which the king maintained power and control over aristocracy aristocratic families in this increasingly chaotic time. There was no stable bureaucracy at Angkor or Angkor Wat, with appointed officials uh, being able to run the state. So the king did everything from settling disputes to redistribution of resources, which meant that when the king died, the whole architecture of the Angkor of Angkor and the Khmer Empire also came undone. So as I mentioned, there's increasing competition uh, from outside of the kingdom by Thai kingdoms forced into Cambodia by Mongol raiding, which began to stretch the financial resources of the Khmer Empire. There's also a deteriorating economy as a result of increased silting of massive waterworks. So Khmer, the Khmer Empire was no longer able to sustain the level of production, agricultural production needed to maintain this large population as a result of this, this silting in the waterworks that fed agricultural areas, which led to economic strain. So to summarize, there's several similarities that can be drawn across Southeast Asian civilizations. They had centralized bureaucracies with regional administrators. There was the construction of large religious structures. In Mohandaro, we see bath structures. In the Khmer Empire, we see large temple complexes. There was divine kingship linked to Hinduism in both contexts. And there was an economy that was fundamentally based on agriculture as well as maritime trade. In lecture 4.3, we'll talk a little bit more about these complex city-states by looking at China.